I'd like to get started. I'd like to welcome you to, um, this is another uh, lecture talk in a series that I've titled the Boeing Schol Scholars of Teacher Education series that in the past has brought in people such as Thomas Phillip from UCLA, uh, Viv Ellis, uh, the time he came to the University of Oxford, Jamie Stillman, um, at the University of Colorado now, and Edwards University of Oxford earlier this year, uh, John Diamond from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and today we have the distinguished Lonnie Horn, formerly of UW, and uh, for the Still last in spirit in many ways. number of years at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee, and to introduce Lonnie is uh, Sue Nolan, one of her collaborators in research during her years yes. here. Partners in crime. Partners in crime, that's exactly the way I was going to say it, yeah. Um, hi, welcome, and welcome back to our um, former and cherished colleague, Lonnie Horn. We're very pleased to have her. This is what she does, so there'll be a test on that later. Um, so uh, Lonnie's work began before she got to UW. We did stuff here, and it's continuing on at Vanderbilt, where she, where she currently is. Um, and it's mainly focused on ways to make authentic mathematics accessible to all students, especially those who've been historically disenfranchised by the educational system. Um, so she has kind of a two-pronged focus. One is on the, math, the classroom practices that engage the most learners in mathematics, and the second is on how teaching is a situated practice, and so how what happens, what teachers do in classrooms is situated within the social context that they, um, in which they teach. And so she's, she thinks a lot about ways to organize the work of mathematics teachers in ways uh, at the departmental level, at the school level, at the district level that support effective instruction for students. So. Um, a few of her projects um, uh, while she was here at Washington, Lonnie and I worked on um, what's become the, what we call the Novice Teacher Study, which was a four-year ethnographic longitudinal study of beginning teachers in math and social studies. Um, and as, uh, as an outgrowth of that work, she developed a second project where she and Sunshine Campbell worked together to develop um, uh, a way of doing methods instruction that revolutionized, um, I think, the learning of the math students and, and had a huge impact on the redesign of our teacher ed program. Um, they invented mediated field experience where they actually do methods instruction in classrooms um, in collaboration with teachers, all in, and so the students and the teachers and the instructors are all in the same room debriefing what everybody saw and helping the students really learn to see in a completely different way. And um, that continues to be used and is continuously uh, amazingly effective. Um, uh, she also has worked on professional learning opportunities as teachers discuss data. Uh, and has investigated that and has some recent publications and is part of the middle school math and the institutional setting of teaching or MIST project. Um, that, the PI for that is Paul Cobb and our own Kara Jackson is also a collaborator on that project, which is a, a, a very ambitious project to work in collaboration with large urban school districts to change the way math instruction gets done. Um, to be more equitable and more effective for more kids. So, you know, she, in, in her spare time, um, she's a noted blogger and uh, all around fabulous person. We're very glad to have you back, if only for a short time. One more. Thank you, Sue. So Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It, it's been, uh, needless to say, very nostalgic for me to. Uh, be back here and see how I do with the small talk while this gets set up again. Um, you know, it's like anytime you go back to a place you spent a critical part of your life, there's things that are exactly the same and things that are totally different. And uh, 
It's, it's nice to see the familiar faces in the room. So let's see if we can get this going again. All right, awesome. So the title of my talk today is What Does It Mean to Know in Teaching? And thinking about how we talk about how teachers know what they know um, and what that means for teacher education. And um, Sue gave a nice summary of some of the work I've been doing um, for the last 10 years. Um, and this is sort of an underlying question for me. It has been since the very beginning of uh, my life as a researcher. Um, in graduate school, I became really interested. I you know, took classes with Jean Lave and became really interested in this idea of situated learning and, and what does it mean to think about what people are actually doing instead of sort of the ideal types that, that are out there about what people should be doing. And so that, that's a space I've, I've uh, enjoyed operating and thinking in. And I've, in my uh, later years as a researcher, um, I've liked to take talks like this as an opportunity to think synthetically across multiple studies. I don't like to just report, like basically give you a verbal version of a research paper, because I figure there's plenty of time for you to, ha ha, there's, <laughs> sorry, bad choice of words. You all have a chance sometimes if you're really motivated to read research papers. Um, but we don't, I don't feel like we have enough spaces in our field to kind of like connect dots. So I enjoy using um, these opportunities when we can actually have a discussion to try to think across studies and ask sort of these bigger conceptual questions. So I'm like that little squirrel. I'm kind of using this as an opportunity to stretch myself to see if I can kind of grab a new nut. I don't know if that's a good metaphor either, but... Um, <laughs> But to see if I can, I can use this as a chance to think with you about some, some issues that have, have weighed on me as I do my work. So clearly, I think pretty much at least the people I know in this room agree that this knowledge question matters in teaching, right? It, it's consequential for what we think teacher certification is. What, what, what do we want people to qualify and prove that they know and can do in order to be called a teacher? And this has certainly been contested lately. I was telling Ken at breakfast this morning that I just read yesterday, Randy Weingarten um, tweeted out that uh, the director or the head or whatever of education in Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts, said he wasn't really sure what the point of teacher certification was. So to, to say that this is not an ongoing question is wrong. Um, I don't know that the head of the American Medical Association would raise the same question about what it means to be a doctor. Um, so we have this as an ongoing issue. And, and that relates to larger issues of professionalism. Who, who has the status of an expert in, in the field of teaching and teacher education, right? And it's another thing that Ken and I were talking about today. Um, and obviously this is really consequential. The knowledge question is really consequential to issues of teacher education. I assume many of you in the room engage in teacher education, whether pre-service education or professional development work. And certainly we have to have a plan of what we're trying to help people learn and what we want them to know. Right? That's underlying all of the endeavors. So, so this knowledge question, I think, is pretty central to, to the enterprise. And looking over, this is basically my lifetime, um, there's a few paradigms that kind of have been influential. Um, the process product research, where you know, it was about cataloging, cataloging teacher behaviors and trying to correlate them with, with student learning outcomes. Um, Lee Shulman's idea of pedagogical content knowledge in the mid 80s. Um, and then Hilda Borko and others have tried to kind of put out this idea of situated knowledge as, as another way of thinking about teacher knowledge. But there's no doubt in my mind that the dominant paradigm has been this idea of pedagogical content knowledge. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's, let's talk about that. Pedagogical content knowledge. Um, so. When Lee Shulman gave the AERA address where he kind of put out this idea, he, he, taught, he called it the missing paradigm in teacher education, right? That, that we didn't really have a good way of conceptualizing or articulating 
what the specialized knowledge of te for teachers is, and it relates to this idea of certification of professionalism, teacher education, right? We needed, we needed that paradigm in order to really become a profession. And I can't really exactly nail down in any of his papers like a clear definition. It sort of evolves across the papers, but basically it's this, right? It's, it's the regularly taught topics in a subject area, the useful representations of ideas, the powerful analogies, illustrations, examples, explanations, and demonstrations, what makes learning of specific topics easy and difficult. So this is, this is the stuff that distinguishes somebody who has expertise, say, in English language arts or writing or science or mathematics, who might know the content itself, what, what distinguishes their knowledge and expertise from somebody who is good at teaching that knowledge and expertise, right? So you're all probably fairly familiar with this idea, but just in case you're not, here's uh, kind of an example. So error analysis is a place where pedagogical content knowledge becomes really important. So a teacher might see a student make the following mistake. 7 divided by 12 is 1.5. Now, somebody who knows mathematics can see that that's wrong, because clearly 7 twelfths is less than 1. But that's a an error that a student can produce, and a good teacher can look at that and have a good prediction of what the student did in producing that error. And it probably looks like this. They put the seven in the wrong place, and they took that one remainder of five and decided that's a decimal, right? And anyone who's taught arithmetic has seen this on a pretty regular basis. So it's the kind of thing that a teacher of mathematics would be exposed to on a fairly regular basis. So there's no doubt in my mind that Shulman has had a really powerful legacy in teacher education. If we sort of just look at the network of scholars who have worked under him or under his, or have been strongly influenced by his thinking, um, it's pretty profound. And you know, you look at the citations, um, Shulman's 1986 paper last time I checked was cited 13,781 times, his 87 paper 13,050 times. I mean, it's kind of monstrous. Um, and, you know, Borka, like I said, she did an AERA presidential address where she pushed in and said, you know, let's think about situated knowledge in teaching in 2004. It's like an order of magnitude less. It's been cited 2,747. It has not had the same impact on the field, I think it's safe to say, that Shulman's idea has had. Um, because I'm a math educator, I have thought a lot about how pedagogical content knowledge has been used, particularly in mathematics education. Um, and mathematical knowledge for teaching, and we won't get into the politics of why it's called something different than PCK, but it's basically PCK for math, um, has been pretty well articulated by a number of scholars, and there's been a lot of research on it. And there's no doubt in my mind that there's been some powerful and important findings related to this particular kind of PCK. So just a couple of examples. Um, teachers' mathematical knowledge for teacher teaching is significantly related to student achievement gains in both, in both first and first grade after controlling for key student and teacher le level covariates. Good to know, okay? And sort of like proof of concept, right? It, it actually matters with um, what kids are learning and what they're able to accomplish, okay? Another one from Hill and friends. There's a significant strong and positive association between levels of mathematical knowledge for teaching and the mathematical quality of instruction. So it's not just about these achievement measures, but all, actually the quality of instruction changes. And there's a number of important factors that mediate this relationship, da 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 da. Okay, so good construct, good idea, powerful. A lot, a lot to, to say in its favor. Um, I argue that uh, core practices, like this is from Teaching, but Teaching Works website at University of Michigan, I, I'm going to argue that these are kind of informed by the construct of PCK, of pedagogical content knowledge. That when we look at what do we want teachers to know and be able to do, what do we want new teachers to be able to do to be safe to practice, profession ready, choose your, choose your language of choice. Um, this is sort of the list that the people at Teaching Works came up with. And here's just a few examples. Eliciting and interpreting individual students' thinking, diagnosing particular common patterns of student thinking and development in the subject matter domain. So you can sort of see the links from that definition I gave of what pedagogical content knowledge is. 
um, and those in particular, implementing norms and routines for classroom discourse and work, coordinating and adjusting instruction. So these second two have more to do with the work of instruction and running a classroom, but certainly those first two, and, and we could probably argue that the, that high quality routines would, would be built into a concepts of, of what students need to know um, and how, how they need to learn it. So, and also the last one too, I would, I could easily make an argument that that's related to pedagogical content knowledge. But it's pretty, it's pretty built around this core practices idea is pretty built around this, this idea of needing to develop pedagogical content knowledge in, in novice teachers. So that being said, there are some legitimate critiques we can make of this idea of teaching knowledge and teaching, right? My first one comes out of being a secondary person. The, the strongest research has been in elementary classrooms. I think that's interesting. I'm looking at Mark and Jessica, because you guys don't always work in elementary classrooms. Um, but I'd say that the, the when you actually like zero in on that construct of like mathematical knowledge for teaching or pedagogical content knowledge, that the strongest, most robust work has been in elementary classrooms. And there's something about adolescence that I think sort of changes the dynamics of teaching and learning in classrooms. Um, and I can say more about that if you want to ask me questions about it later. Um, the other thing is that pedagogical content knowledge really focuses on individual teachers' knowledge and practice. The pedagogical content knowledge resides within an individual, which makes sense because the enterprise of teacher education is to prepare individuals to somehow go out into the world and be good teachers. But we know that the landscape of where they might be going out is pretty highly variable. So that's a really, a really complicated part of being a teacher educator, right, is we don't know where people are going after they leave us. Um, so we kind of are, that's our problem to solve, is what are we going to do to prepare individuals? But it's still, it still, it doesn't really deal with a lot of the context that, that people have to navigate or their own identities in relationship to the students that they're serving. Um, I also would argue that it relies on ideal types of practice. So it's prescriptive in a sense, um, rather than descriptive. It, it's saying this is what teaching should be, rather than building off of what teaching is. Um, and I think that the strongest critique that is at the center of my work is that this, as a construct, pedagogical content knowledge is very cognitive and very individualistic. Why does that matter? Well, because there's a, there's a tendency in all these studies of teaching, especially like you're going from process product, to focus on these visible behaviors of teaching and less of a focus on the purposes that are served by these behaviors, right? So it's this idea of that meaning is being constructed when we're teaching. And, and unless we're paying attention to how meaning is being constructed, we can't really separate the behavior itself from the context, right? So this is where my work sort of parts ways with the idea of pedagogical content knowledge. I, I really think about teachers' practice as taking place within schools and communities amidst different policies, with different kinds of politics, with different kinds of relationships between communities and schools. Um, so what this teacher knows matters for sure, but it exists in relationship to a bunch of different levels, it, it, to the organization itself, perhaps if she's a secondary teacher, to her department, and to the community at large. And this is where I start to investigate the work of teaching. I really think about what would happen if we decided to take a more situative perspective on teacher knowledge. So instead of looking at individuals as the unit of analysis, thinking about individuals in context. So to that end, some of what Sue was describing about what I've done is, is I really try to think about teacher learning in context. And, um, 
I've probably spent more hours than I want to try to actually calculate listening to teach hundreds of hours of, of teacher work group conversations. So it's just one step removed from the classroom. I, I care about what teachers do in the classroom, but I care about how they think about what they do in the classroom. So this is why I listen to them talking to colleagues. And I think of them as sort of found talk aloud protocols. So there's this tradition in the study of learning to have people talk aloud as they're solving problems. And I take that idea, but I kind of take an anthropological view of, OK, you all are gathered to, to talk about what you're doing in the classroom. Let me eavesdrop on it and make sense of how you're interpreting um, that work. So found talk allowed protocols as ped of their pedagogical reasoning. And the framework I've been developing is really thinking about what are the opportunities for teachers to learn in these conversations? What conceptions are they bringing of the work? How are they even defining the problems that they're confronting? And then, and then how are they learning about them by talking together? This is maybe the center, but to varying degrees in the different studies I've done, I also incorporate classroom observations, interviews, surveys, and artifact analysis. So it's not that I only look at this, at the teachers, but I'm really, really interested in their reasoning, and I found this a really fruitful place to plant my camera. Um, so this idea of opportunities to learn, how I think about that, is I look at two things. Um, I, well, first I, I ask this question, how do these conversations stand to support new forms of practice and understanding? That's my idea of learning. And I take that from Jim Greeno and Melissa Grisalfi. And what I look for is these two things. I look for what conceptual resources are being developed, negotiated, and deployed as the teachers are talking together. And secondly, how are these conversations mobilizing teachers for future work? Now, although when I look at opportunities to learn, I take kind of an agnostic view. They can be learning to do something that I think is totally horrifying, but that's learning in, in this framework. It's not this sort of prescriptive, normative view of what learning is. Um, I'm not agnostic about what good teaching is, so I look and see, hold up against what are they learning here against a pretty clear vision of good mathematics teaching. So, I have in the background this idea of ambitious instruction as the goal, but my idea is to sort of think about how we might engineer what is toward what we want it to be, right? So ambitious instruction, and this is probably an idea familiar to many of you there, are, are, has sort of a, a particular set of assumptions about what the role of teachers is, what the role of content is, and what students should be doing in the classroom. So, Teachers' job is to design effective learning environments. They need to center their instruction on student thinking. Um, they should attend to issues of student culture, language, and background. Um, mathematics should be something that's in the making, not something that's already like dictated and produced for students to digest. Mathematics is not hierarchical as a sequence of ideas to be mastered, but rather a, a network of connected ideas and concepts that students can explore. Student ex success in this framework needs to include all students, and it's about them learning to model and interpret the world mathematically, and, and, and it focuses on their sense making. And that's sort of my quick and dirty idea of, a summary rather, of what ambitious instruction is. So you can see I kind of pivot between the sort of what is, what are teachers actually doing, and this idea of what I wish want there to be. And it's, it's complicated, um, but I've found it to be productive. And I'm just going to kind of briefly give you like an overview of a few um, findings from a, couple, a few studies. So in my dissertation work, I looked at in-service teachers, and I found that they draw on a bunch of conceptual resources in their workplace to make sense of pro problems of practice. So workplaces are consequential for how teachers are doing this problem setting and problem defining. So we can do whatever we want in teacher education in terms of saying this is what you should be doing, but there's going to be this friction, this, this tension that they have to negotiate with workplace that we can either prepare them for or not. And when we don't, Sue and I found out what happens, which is they kind of capitulate to what's going. I mean, that's a long-standing finding, but, but the, the, these concepts are built into the workplace, the organization of their work. Um, the second study, and you'll recognize some names there, the novice teacher study that Sue mentioned, 
is that when, when we traced, when Sue and Chris and Sunshine and I traced what the um, novice teachers did when they went out into full-time teaching, the, the practices that were the hardest for them to sustain were the most interactive ones, which of course are the ones we value the most, right? And that had to do with the uncertainty of them what do you do when this fails? What do you do when you had a, had a this particular uh, face this particular roadblock? And the contingent the contingent nature of interactive practices, right? What I say next depends on what you give me. So the, these most adaptive practices were the ones that tanked the first. So anyway, that's how the world is. Sorry. Um, and then the last one. And uh, I think Merg, we're going to be discussing this tomorrow. So if you want to hear more about it, you can come to Kara's research group. Um, was that there? I we looked at um, teachers' talk, and we kind of distinguished them by how accomplished they were in instru ambitious instruction. And we found that the teachers who were more accomplished in ambitious instruction, when they talked about problems of practice, they interpreted those problems more ecologically. So the way I describe it is if there's teaching students and content, the less accomplished teachers could really just talk about one of those factors and be really comfortable about it. Oh, we're teaching this tomorrow because it's what's next in the book or whatever. The more ambitious teachers, it was like a mobile where those things were all kind of interconnected. And they couldn't really talk about the mathematics without talking about the students, without talking about the instructional decisions. Those things were much more tightly clustered in their mind. And we, we, we characterize that as being sort of an, ecologi kind of an ecological thinking about the classroom. They also did a lot more student perspective taking. They, they thought through their planning and their lesson design based on students' experiences and the evidence that they had gathered from their classroom, whether it was through classroom discourse or through student work, they, they designed and planned by thinking about students' experiences, both affective and cognitive. So, um, where I kind of pushed away a little bit from pedagogical content knowledge, which I think is important, as I hope I've made clear, is I also think another really key part to ambitious instruction is this idea of pedagogical judgment. That pedagogical content knowledge is sort of static as a construct. And I think I've seen some versions of core practices that end up being a little static too. I don't want to call, I mean, I know I've seen very good versions of it, especially by people in this room, but I find that when it goes out from the people who originally conceptualize it, it becomes kind of a static thing, a set of procedures, almost a Lamavian, just do these things checklist, as opposed to something that needs to live and create meaning between teachers and students. So that this idea of pedagogical judgment is really, really critical in distinguishing between sort of everyday regular teaching and this kind of more ambitious goal. And what I found, like I said, is that these accomplished teachers, their judgments are informed by interpretive reasoning, ecological reasoning, and empathic reasoning, the student perspective taking. So that is sort of the empirical basis from which I want to build pedagogies of teacher education. So I want to think about this question. How can teacher education support interpretive, ecological, and, and empathic reasoning? So I'm going to talk about two things I've tried. I don't know the actual answer, like I can't tell you, and this is what I found, and it works every time in every situation. But these are ways, these next two studies I'm going to tell you about are ways that I and my colleagues have, have tinkered with this question. I'm trying to inculcate judgment, pedagogical judgment, towards ambitious teaching. So the first example was something I developed here and that Sue mentioned was this idea of mediated field experiences. And mediated field experiences happened. It was a progression of activities. We started with what would be like a typical university activity. Um, then we would go into our partner teachers' classrooms and have a guided observation um, in those classrooms. Then we would have these debriefs in with the teachers. Um, important to the guided observation was that we paired novice teachers with struggling students who were distinctly not like them. 
And this was to try to interrupt the narcissistic nature of teaching of people being self-referential, novices being self-referential and trying to imagine what students are experiencing. So if we had a student who'd never learned a foreign language, we'd put them next to an immigrant student. If we had a student who was super organized, we'd put them next to the kid with the backpack from hell, you know, that kind of thing. So we wanted to push their understanding of what it was to experience school from the perspective of somebody not like them. Um, so we would debrief with the partner teachers who also appreciated having an extra pair of eyes on these kids who they were worried about for one reason or another. And then um, they would do a written reflection on the experience. And this was, we believe that we helped inculcate some of these interpretive, ecological, and empathic forms of reasoning. So Sunshine and I wrote this paper based on the work we did when I was here. And we looked at three of our pre-service teachers and, and sort of critical learning events they had that were facilitated by the mediated field experience. And the critical learnings are just over there in the left-hand column. Um, Luke learned that maintaining norms is not about a whole class thing, that it has to happen across different activity structures. Good. Uh, Hannah learned that on task and being engaged are not the same thing. And Suzanne learned to make distinguish, distinctions between doing school and doing math. And these were all really important learnings for these particular students. I'm not going to go over everything, but I will highlight that, that the idea of maintaining norms across activities is a, sort of a, the seeds of ecological thinking about the classroom. Oops. Oh. I, was, I thought it was going to pop up one at a time. Um, Hannah's learning about um, on task and being engaged is not the same thing. It's sort of an important interpretive framework for thinking about what students are doing in the classroom. And Suzanne making distinctions between doing school and doing math, it was an, for her, for this particular case, it was an empathic understanding of what kids were experiencing in, in doing in her classroom. So I claim that this, for some of our students, provided the seeds of... Um, important foundation for developing pedagogical judgment that could um, feed into ambitious teaching. The second study is something that um, we've been working on at Vanderbilt. Um, this is a dissertation study designed by one of my doctoral students who just finished, Elizabeth Self. And she came up with this great idea of doing simulated encounters to push on cultural competence. Now, how many of you have heard of clinical simulations in medical education? Okay, a few of you, not a lot of you. So, so what this, how this works in medical education is it's a kind of a, a summative assessment. So we learn about different diseases, and then you're going to go and have a 10-minute clinical interview with an actor who's pretending to be a patient, and you have to successfully diagnose that person. You have to sort of elicit the right um, information to be able to give them a correct diagnosis. Okay, that's, that's like a really cheap and fast version of what a clinical simulation is. Liz was recruited by somebody at the medical school to help them assess. They had a bunch of new doctors that they gave um, cultural sensitivity training to, and they wanted to see if it worked or not. So they invited her in because she was really interested in these issues of culture and cultural competence to, to assess these clinical simulations um, in the medical school. And she went, oh, you know what? This would be really cool to do in teacher education. So she's designed um, a few simulated encounters to create critical incidents for teachers learning. Now, unlike medical education, which uses them summatively, we use them formatively to sort of surface existing understandings. And I'm looking at Debbie right now because we actually use the phrase all the time that we're trying to pull them up short. We want to pull them up short and surface their, their sort of tacit understandings of culture, of their own position and power in relation to the people they're interacting with. So these, are, these sims are designed to navigate the unexpected. Because we know that, that there's this, the kind of things we can know in teaching, and then a big part of being a teacher and a big part of pedagogical judgment is navigating the uncertainty, right? So we want them to start to understand that we're not going to be able to tell them this is what you do and every time it's going to work, but you're going to have to think on your feet a lot and who you are in relation to the people you're interacting with is going to be really, really important in, how, in developing those skills. So the three that we've studied, the, oh, actually, I only have two and then a new one. Okay, so the one that we've studied the most and the one that Liz wrote her dissertation was about, about is the one that's pictured here, which is a black student 
And the scenario is he's in your honors class, and on Friday, your class was doing group work, and you called them back together, and you heard Darius's voice above everybody else's, and you said, Darius, could you be quiet? And he put his back, backpack on and said, this is some bullshit, and, ran out, and walked out of the room. So the encounter is you've called him back into your class, and to meet with you after school. You sent a note to a sixth period teacher and said, can you come meet with me? I want to make sure we don't go into the weekend on this note. And that's what the teachers are given as what the scenario is. And then they have to figure out how to repair their relationship with Darius. Um, we also have a, um, another sim that's about an IEP consent with an immigrant parent. And it becomes evident through the interaction that she's not really tracking what the teacher is saying and they have to somehow navigate that. Um, one that we tried this year was a Christian student wanting to do a report on intelligent design in um, their biology class. So it's all these, the, the kind of key to the design of all of these is that in order to navigate successfully, the, the teacher candidates have to really kind of engage their own cultural identity in relationship to the people they're, they're talking with. So like I said, there's Liz. And we, have, we use the medical school lab, so we're watching all of these things with the actors and the student teachers. And um, it's being recorded, and we have a whole process for how we turn this into a pedagogy. Um, and in general, what we find that teachers are learning is that they're understanding a little more of their institutional role, their power in relation to the people they're interacting with, and also their own positionality, their own culture, gender, racial, linguistic identities, and the way that that's implicated in their interactions with these sort of critical members, these critical stakeholders um, that they interact with. So just to give you a really quick view of what Liz did in her dissertation, where she looked at, at um, a cohort of, of teacher candidates, what they learned from the Darius simulation in particular. Um, there were three groups of sort of outcomes in terms of what the students learned. Some of them became sort of self-aware in the sense that, that's that small gray group in the group number one, where they, they became really self-conscious that they might be misheard or misunderstood. And so they had to really pay attention to what it is that they say and how they say it. The vast majority of our students became what Liz called racially aware, which um, they started to really understand the salience of their own white, most of them are white, as you see, racial identities in relationship to the students that they were serving. And then a small group of students um, became kind of critically aware and, and started to really recognize the privilege of their own racial identities and how that kind of created a partial would like inevitably create a partial view and partial ability to empathize with what students experience. Um, and Liz dug, since we had that one group that was sort of the most common group, she really dug into what was developing and how these students developed racial awareness. And so she looked at how they initially framed their interactions with Darius and how they finally framed their interactions with Darius. So, the initial framing is what did they present when they had to go into this conference? And the first one was, like if you look at Kylie right there, you're not being respectful. You, ha you have to be more quiet because you're not being respectful. Over the course of the sim cycle and thinking about it and processing it, she realized she was defending herself and her own positionality. Lisa framed what was going on between her and Darius as a miscommunication and then she realized at the end that she really was not dealing with his concerns and his experience of racial bias. Um, Miranda also thought of it as a miscommunication and she, like Lisa, realized she wasn't really addressing these issues of racial bias. So I think that there's something that's being kind of uncovered and pressed on here in terms of pedagogical reasoning that's beyond, when, when I've engage my colleagues who do the core practices work. And I've talked to Julie Cohen, I've talked to Elham, less often I've talked to Jessica and Mark, but I've talked to like, I've talked to a lot of folks who are really engaged in, in this work. And they say that this pedagogical judgment stuff comes out in the coaching. 
That's what I hear. It comes out in the coaching. But I've seen the second generation version of core practices, people's students doing it. And what I feel like is happening is that by, by relying on the coaching, but talking about the core practices, it's not being centered enough in those pedagogies. And in the second generation versions, when I, and what I mean is like people's students doing this stuff, it sometimes gets lost in the wash. So I feel like we need, well, I'm kind of jumping ahead myself. I'll tell you what I think we need in a minute. So <laughs> comparing this to a sort of high leverage practice position, implementing norms and routines for classroom discourse, there's nothing inherent in that that makes me deal as a pre-service teacher or teacher candidate with my own power and positionality in relationship to my students. Um, likewise, building really respectful relationships with students or talking about a student with caregivers. These are all things that are kind of being represented in these sims in particular, but they're still not the, the kind of critical reflection piece, and it's not necessarily being surfaced. If we rely solely on the coaching, it may or may not happen depending on the quality of the coaching. So here's where I started to jump ahead to. This isn't an either or. It's not like I'm saying core practices have no place in teacher education. I really think that there needs to be both. There needs to be a way for, for teacher candidates to develop not only a good answer to what should I do in the classroom, but how should I think about it? How should I think about it? How should I adapt? How should I make sense of troubles that come, inevitably come up? To really have a framework for uncertainty and contingency and for navigating that as they work with students. And I think of this Dewey quote from um, The Moral Principles in Education. He, he's, I found this picture on the internet, I was so happy. So Dewey said in The Moral Principles of Education, he, he has this quote, I'm told there's a swimming school in a certain city where youth are taught to swim without going in the water being repeated drill, repeatedly drilled in various movements which are necessary for swimming. When one of the young men so trained was asked what he did when he got in the water, he laconically replied, sunk. This story happens to be true. And my concern is that I feel like all this uncertainty and contingency is sort of the water that teachers swim in. It is, it is the resistance, it's the pressure, it's what might make us drown. Right? So we've got to kind of have a way of preparing teachers for that part of the work that they're doing in addition for the movements and the routines in order to really help them learn to be effective teachers. Thank you. Oh, did you want me to? You want to take a picture? It is a pretty awesome. <laughs> I mean, look at her face, too. So, and with that, I'm happy to open up to questions. and Jessica are both raising their hand. Do you have a mic? Is that a microphone or a water bottle, Ken? Oh. A water bottle. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a, a clarifying question. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about um, the difference between um, how you're talking about situated learning and Borco situated knowledge. Like, how are you building? Um, I think I'm digging deeper into a Greeno sense of it. I think Hilda's paper, the 2004 paper, is really trying to say, hey, teachers are working in context and we need a different unit of analysis for thinking about what they're learning. And I feel like I'm trying to dig deeper into that by like drawing on Jim Greeno, the Greeno and Grisolfi paper about, well, what would opportunities to learn look like in a sort of a situative perspective? And Jim's really deliberate about using situative and not situated because he says that if you say situated, then it suggests that there's a not situated, and it's not, he doesn't want there to be an implicit contrast. But so I think because I have a background as a learning scientist, I think I kind of bring that perspective. 
to sort of think about the nuts and bolts of how to operationalize that concept. Cap, do you have a question? I was, I was just going to make a connection between your argument and the one that Jamie Stillman and Lauren Anderson raised. You mm -hmm. know that paper, because I think it's they, they frame this in terms of inconsistent engagement with the underlying learning theory that most of us bring to our work. But we end up, before we know it, it's kind of we're sliding back into an acquisition yes. way of thinking about learning when really we're trying to grasp what the meaning of a more participatory view of learning might be. So it seems like that's what's going on here. Yeah, I think that, um, and I would say, when I look at what teachers do and how school is organized, school is really organized for an acquisition theory of learning. So teachers who are working from a, like this ambitious perspective are working against the grain of how school is organized. And I would, I would say even more so in the current accountability climate where you know, they're now having to navigate curriculum maps that you know, often dictate what they're supposed to, especially in math, what they're supposed to be teaching every six weeks. And there's tests to make sure it's happened. So it, it pulls teachers even further from really thinking hard about what their students know and can do because there, there's this other set and of so obligations. Teacher education organized around an acquisition model of learning. You think about the way the standards function and the yeah. way in which we're constantly pressed to talk about what teachers know and can do. Right. And exactly. In which that's grounded in acquisition view of learning. I mean, we're struggling with the same stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mark. So, Lonnie, could you go back to a, a slide that's probably right in the middle of your presentation around uh, kind of characteristics you found of uh, your teacher education students who seem to do the most ambitious work. I think they were your students, and that they were able. Yeah. No, they, okay, so this was this was um, in service teachers. This one. Yeah, could you say a little bit more about taking students' perspectives and how that was? I mean, that seems like it co-occurred with ambitious teaching. Yes, it did. Are you saying that it has some? impact on ambitious teaching? I can't say causality, but I'm saying that it was distinct. So what this study was, and it's the one we're talking about in Kara's research group tomorrow, is we looked at three teacher work groups who were sort of at different levels of accomplishment. They were all working in a PD project trying to learn to teach mathematics ambitiously. But where they were when you looked at their classroom practices, you could kind of group them in these beginning and emergence and the sophisticated group. And one of the things that really stood out when we, we like went nuts in studio code and coded their discourse um, was that the most accomplished group did a whole bunch of student perspective taking as they were trying to solve different problems of practice. As they were trying to think, what are we going to teach tomorrow? What do we need to test them on? It's almost like they couldn't talk about that without thinking about student experience, without drawing out evidence of what the students were knowing and experiencing in their classrooms. Whereas the other teachers really could not engage with that and just be like, well, we need to teach this because this is what the next chapter is. And they would talk about students in the aggregate more and less about, well, the student, there are some students who are struggling. There was less nuance in how they took student perspective. So, I mean, when you think about like the idea in ambitious teaching that we need to like attend to students knowing and understanding, they were doing that, like in their talk. Well, just the reason that strikes me and probably Jessica too is we, yeah. that's what we have consistently found the, our most ambitious teachers. These are pre-service teachers going into their first year, mm -hmm. but we see evidence of it almost as soon as they get into the program. So interesting. We could see it as though it's like some pre-existing, it's like a combination of values and perspective taking ability right. or interest. I don't know what it actually is, but I'd like more of it. Well, I know that like the assignment that, um, Sue, was it an assessment or adolescent development that we had that assignment here where we had them shadow a student? Yeah. yeah. No, we still, they, they still do that as part of the course. I mean, I feel like we try to structure things and experiences them, and I think that in the mediated field experience, having them paired with a struggling student who's distinctly not like them in some way is also a way to get them out of their, their sort of solipsism, their, their self-referential um, framework, because when you, when you talk to not just novice teachers, but teachers who aren't really thinking more broadly about 
the diversity of students in their room, they'll often say, well, I liked that when I was a student. I liked when my teachers did X or Y, which usually you're not the best example to draw on for all the kids who you're obligated, you know, you're trying to serve here. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add that, that, that I think that that aspect of mediated field experience was actually the most consequential for students that I taught then in adolescent development, because we still are still teaching that. Uh -huh. We were inventing this and trying it out. It went, the math students went from kind of puzzle acquiescence about how they should try to figure out something about students' adolescent development to being the most powerful advocates in the room for why you had to really understand your students in order to be able to teach them. Because if you didn't get this stuff, I mean, like, it was, by the time they got to adolescent development, it was a no-brainer for them that they needed to learn this stuff because, because it was important to really be able to take the student's perspective. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, one of the one of the things I I just showed the three that Sunshine and I wrote about, but like one of the examples that we had was we had a student who never learned a second language, never really traveled much, um, who was sitting next to an immigrant student who, for the first I don't know however many visits, like the the student really didn't do much in class, and when we have our debriefs. The student was very, our pre-service teacher was pretty frustrated. Oh, the student doesn't get what's going on at all and kind of talking in deficit ways about this young woman. And then the teacher did an activity where manipulatives were involved and this, the student flew. The immigrant student flew. She was able to show so much of what she knew. And I mean, talk about being pulled up short, Debbie. This, this student's mind was blown. Like, he had not seen a glimmer of that competence, of that mathematical thinking, up until the moment when the tool was available to her for her to show what she knew. And he couldn't stop talking about it the rest of the semester because his mind was so blown by that. And, and you know, when you think about how teachers debate over things like manipulative use, it's usually very self referential Oh, that's so babyish. I hated when my teachers, blah, blah, blah. But when you see how powerful that is for a student who that's her in, that's her way of accessing the content and showing what she knows, it's like a whole other conversation, right? So, I'm yeah. just thinking, um, I understand the, what your argument about broadening from the core practices to develop this more ecological, mm -hmm. contextual awareness. Mm -hmm deeper understanding of themselves and the students in cultural mm -hmm. terms. Um, but I'm wondering, a common issue is you prepare people to enact these practices and sometimes even developing cultural competence, as those examples show. And then they hit schools that uh, none of this stuff is valued or going on. And I'm wondering, is there another dimension about how do you take what you bring, yes. your broader vision, and your ability to enact practices and taking into account the fact that you're enacting them and using Cochrane Smith's notion against the, against grain. the grain. So what I'm talk suggesting is sort of a political dimension along with the awareness right. and skill development. I think that this group of teachers that were critically aware kind of were more ready to take that on because they understood not only their positionality in relationship to students, but they understood the power, the institutional role that they were playing in a different way. And I think that in order to really teach against the grain, you have to understand your position in this institution, which is sort of designed for social reproduction, and to have strategies and ways of thinking yeah. about how, how that position, how you need to kind of be a a buffer between those institutional processes and the sort of humanistic goals of, of learning and teaching that you're trying to inculcate in your classroom. And I believe that there are some schools where that work is untenable. I mean, you and I were talking yeah. this morning about teachers getting fired for, for advocating for, for those kinds yeah, of I started issues. out in the National Teacher Corps, my first job as a teacher educator, and that whole program, which existed in over 100 sites around the country to prepare teachers for high poverty urban and rural schools, the, the general consensus is that you know the interns went in with their uh, new ideas and new practices and, and sort of took the position that everything that existed there was horrible and we needed to you know get rid of it and so there was no strategy about right. actually how to implement given the situation they were in those new strategies and the end result was that they were sort of squashed um, and the um, 
consensus is that there was no major impact uh, on schools by these revolutionaries who went in sure. um, and had, you know, developed uh, a consciousness that went beyond just sort of cultural competence. They had this sort of critique of the systems and structures and the society that were behind everything, and, but they had no strategy when they right. went in. And at a certain point, the program introduced sort of this political dimension to the curriculum to try to teach them how to operate smartly when I went into the schools with their sort of uh, deeper vision and ability to use skills. Yeah, I think that um, thinking of, I'm trying to remember the phrases people use for this, it's um, strategic non-compliance, um, and Rochelle Gutierrez writes about, she has a Spanish word for it, which I'm not going to remember. But this idea of, of pushing back and being politically aware, and that part of what I believe we need to teach new teachers is what the nature of those practices are. How do you deal with when you're given, here's what you're assessed, going to be assessed on every six weeks, and here's your curriculum map, and you look and you know what your students need, and it's not that curriculum map? Like, that's a dilemma that all of our, my students experience. So like, let's talk about that. And we have a, a class at Vanderbilt we call Mathematical Literacies, and one of our classes is on um, the topic of algebra for all or algebra forever. And what are you gonna be doing when you're making decisions about algebra placement, which has a huge equity implications, and you are dealing with where students' achievement levels are at, you know, and I think that that surfacing these dilemmas, talking to students about it, talking to experienced teachers, and honestly, that's part of what came out of the mediated field experience, too, is that we were talking to teachers and partnered with teachers who developed some critical awareness and were able to explain and articulate um, the nature of these strategies and the choices that they were making to try to sustain their students despite some institutional processes that were less than sustaining. Yes. Hi, um, thanks for your talk. You uh, talked about um, perspective taking and with Mark and Jessica talked a little bit about the sort of cognitive lens on that. Mm -hmm. But I think the data also have shades of socio-emotional cognitive yes, in that. Yes, absolutely. Could you talk a little bit about how you saw that, how you identified that, what role that plays in teacher education? Yeah, I mean, I, I could speak as a math educator again, and one of the things that we know is that by the time kids are in secondary math, a lot of damage has been done to their self-concept um, as math learners. And so a lot of the work that teachers need to do is around this sort of social, social and emotional and identity um, work around building back their sense of competence in math and not by blowing smoke, but by truly identifying ways that, and, and giving them opportunities, like the example of the um, emergent bilingual student who was able to use manipulatives successfully, like giving them forums to show their competence and then really bringing that out and using that sort of strengths-based approach to, um, to identifying and sort of restoring um, a positive mathematical identity. So that, that's sort of like at the practice level, but in the teacher level, like the teacher talk level, um, the, one of the examples that cracked me up that happened in that sophisticated work group was um, the teachers were talking about how kids freeze as soon as there's a fraction in the problem. Like they just shut down and they're not thinking or sense making anymore. So this one teacher says, yeah, she was talking about doing slope problems. She goes, yeah, I just call it rise over run. They say, it's a fraction. I said, no, 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 it's just rise over run. And it's like a whole other experience, she says. She just names it something different so that kids can like engage in sense making. And then she's able to go, yeah, yeah, actually, those are fractions. But you know, we don't have to think of them that way. So it's like, it's sort of like these games we play, but to, to sort of um, keep students engaged and keep them invited and, and keep them from shutting down, because we, that's what we see a ton in math classes is kids just shut down because they're just like, how do I, how do I play this game of school and it has nothing to do with actually making sense of the work in front of them. So, I, there's a question in the very back. And then. Um, and mine is similar to that one. My question was, um, with the accomplished and ambitious instruction teachers, 
you mentioned that they take students' perspectives more frequently. How do they take those students' perspectives? Like, is it during the, 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 the time of interaction? Is it, do they notice something maybe they pull them aside later? Like, what was that? So is this is in the work group. This is in the work group conversations as they're, like, defining problems that are coming up and trying to figure out how to solve them. So one of the, like, discourse structures I've noticed in teachers' talk is this idea of replays and rehearsals. So replays are... This is what happened in my class, and I'm going to tell you the story. Rehearsals are, this is what I'm going to do, and this is how I'm going to say it. But it's actual like templates of classroom dialogue. And the replays and rehearsals in the sophisticated group, um, the more accomplished group, they were more dialogic. It wasn't just like, this is how I present this idea. But I said this, and then a kid said that, and so I said this other thing. So you hear both voices in there, which is like, to me, it's super interesting that, that, that that's clearly part of their sense-making process is not just thinking about what they do and how they perform as a teacher, but how they're going to interact with kids. And so sometimes it's about specific kids. Oh, I said this in my class, and then so-and-so said this, and I, I responded in this way. And then teachers will sometimes latch onto that. Oh, yeah, that happened in my fifth period, too. But this is how it went down. And then they'll tell their version of the story. And across those little narratives, we start to see these sort of, like, examples, these archetypes of these are the kind of interactions that we can anticipate. And, and these are some sort of some responses and some ways of coping with them and, 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 and keeping kids engaged or whatever the problem is at hand. So, and Tana, you had a... Um, how do you think these results or even the like testing out the same activity would look different when in service teaching? So Liz has tried that. She's she's tried it, and um, she anytime she is writing a sim, or she or any of our colleagues are writing a sim, they they do a bunch of pilots. They do it partly for the actors because the actors are working improvisationally, and they kind of want to have a sense of what to expect and to kind of coach them and and like oh you need to do it more this way because you know whatever. But also to sort of as as instructors to try to start to think about anticipate the kind of range of responses. Um, it's really, really interesting. Um, experienced teachers are sometimes a little more resistant with the, like the partiality of like here's the incident, here's the background, and like it's like a one page because teachers work in such like on such broader time scales of relationships with people. I think it's more authentic with the parent conference because I think parent conferences really are this sort of like whoa, okay, now I'm talking to this person who I've never met before. Whereas relationships with students have like, exist on larger time scales, so it's interesting. Um, I can't say like across the board because Liz, Liz has done some work as like a professional development experience for in-service teachers. There's not a lot of difference a lot of the time between some of the ways they end up interacting. Um, with really like accomplished, experienced teachers, there's some pretty profound differences. I mean, I, I can only sort of talk about it at that level. We haven't really investigated systematically. I could tell you stories for like the next hour, though. <laughs> yeah, Jessica. So I'm wondering about this, um, this work group that was more accomplished. Mm -hmm. Not so much what they're capable of, but what what's their context? How is that maybe different than some of the other groups All too? All really similar contexts. So are and, you and, saying that you think that there's something different about them or something different about the way they're working? Or? Something different about the way they're working and thinking about teaching. Um, but it's not, but the cultural supports are similar. Pretty much. I mean, and the, the we can talk about like, well, this administrator was smarter in this way, and but um, yeah, it was part of the PDQ project that we did in Seattle. So all three of them were Seattle schools and demographically similar populations. There was some differences, but and same district context, same PD. That's probably all I'm at liberty to say, like with IRB, but you know. So we're tracking eight different teams, and mm -hmm. we've been tracking them, teams of science teachers mm -hmm. that are in service for three years. Mm -hmm. And some teams are more proficient uh, around the practices, but they've had more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and, there is a time difference. Yeah. And, and then uh, some are 
sort of over three years still really stuck. But mm -hmm. it has a lot to do with the, the kind of mandates that they're all in the same district, but they have very different initiatives in the schools yeah. that are competing. Competing at mandates, uh, yeah. And that do distract from the work. Yeah, this this was, I don't know if you remember because you were a graduate student at the time, but we were given a lot of space to work with these and like all the PD days were dedicated to our work with the teachers and all of that. It wasn't until later mm -hmm. that we started having competing initiatives in the district where we would say, hey, we planned a PD this day and we'd be told, oh no, there's this other initiative and we have, you know. So that happened eventually, but at the time that these data were analyzed, we were given a lot of space, and the teachers were given kind of equal support and had equal buy-in. And um, so the accomplished group had been at it from longer amount of time, so that was a difference. Um, I don't know. I wish I could go back and use some of the measures that we've used on the MISS project now that Karen and I have used, like, like VHQMI and VSMC. Like, I wonder if there's some sort of epistemic differences in how they think about teaching and I mean clearly there are but like as individuals that might also explain some of what was happening at the group level. So like I follow up on yeah. your, your statement about individuals and yeah. groups. So are you taking an individual look at, are you theorizing about let's say that productive group, mm -hmm. are you theorizing about them as a collection of individuals who as individuals have particular ways of talking and engaging around ideas about teaching? Or are you treating the group as a unit of analysis? The group is a unit of analysis, but part of the, the basis for the claim that these are accomplished, they're accomplished in ambitious instruction, is we had our coach go in and she was working with them like on a weekly basis. And at the end of the year, we said, where are they? Like on a sort of, if you were just to sort of say, where are they in terms of meeting the goals of the, the practice? And it wasn't that across the board, everyone was accomplished, but the, the critical mass of them were, and the critical mass of the other group were emergent. Do you see what I'm saying? So um, there's a whole other thing I could talk about in terms of facilitation and dominance and who ends up talking and all of that, but the argument we made in the paper is that on the whole, this is where this group of teachers were, were in terms of their practice, individually. and there, But the unit of analysis is um, the group itself and the nature of their discourse. Yeah, Phil. So, Lonnie, I'm, I'm trying to hold up your framework against um, kind of Anne Roseberry and Beth Warren's line of work around interpretive practice as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, like, if from their frame of um, the power of interpreting the diversity of kids' sense-making practices as this variable history thing that you're trying to orient to, and then Used in an asset best way, asset based way to like mm -hmm. create a more expansive learning mode. Like, mm -hmm. how does that, or does it, like layer into the interpretive ecological stance within your take on, on what? Well, I would put that work beyond core practices as well, because I don't think it's like I don't read their stuff and say, oh, okay, so this is the routine or this is the discourse practice. It is a sort of framework for interpreting what kids' activity is and for approaching it in an asset-based way and as using that as the basis for classroom activity, right? And Some of it is like the like linguistic practices of youth yeah. and understanding those repertoires that they bring in relation to a core practice of like surfacing kids' ideas. Yeah. So yeah. Far. So like you could say that okay, they're talking about eliciting kids' ideas, right? Right. And adapting right. instruction based on kids' ideas, right? Which would fit in with like the teaching works high leverage practice. But my my argument is that in itself, like just saying I know how to do that as a practice without a productive framework for thinking about that and for making judgments about what that work would look like and making those decisions, it doesn't really hold enough weight as sort of like this is what we're aiming for. So I think I, I resonate a lot with that work um, because I think it is talking about what is it to have a productive stance on what kids bring to the classroom and interpreting in ways that are gonna support learning I don't know if that's satisfactory or not, but that's, 
I see it sort of living in the same place a little bit. Because, the, again, and part of like the urgency of my critique is I've seen the second generation people doing core practice work. And I said, oh, it's about eliciting student ideas. Here, practice. And there's not the same sophisticated coaching, which is where that judgment comes out. Because the coach has to notice, did you hear what that kid said? That was something you could have made more out of. And if the, so all we're doing is pushing off the, the pedagogical judgment and reasoning to the coaching. But, but the, I know Elhan's working on stuff around coaching and Lindsay um, Gibbons is working on stuff on coaching. But when we talk about core practices, I think that there's sort of this hope that it's really widely scalable because we've isolated the practices themselves, but we haven't really folded in the, the the critical nature of that judgment and the, the critical nature of those productive frameworks. That's what I'm thinking. I think we're at time, right, Ken? Can I have one more question? I have a question, but I already asked a question. You can have another one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my next question is, um, as you know, I think about leaders, mm -hmm. principals, and um, district leaders. Yeah. And I mean, as do you, and yeah. we see the same stuff, right? Right. Um, with with those folks. So, how, how do you think? How do you? How? What connections do you make? Or how do you think we should think about this in our research and in our teaching? I think it goes back to something that Ken brought up about the sort of like critical view of these mandates and policies. If we just let those a lot of the policies and mandates and systems work unabated and uninterrupted, we get some pretty harsh social reproduction. And I think that the, the sophisticated leaders that I've seen run some interference against some of the more corrosive of those practices and demands. So like even the example that Jessica brought up about these groups that are being, um, where there's all these competing initiatives Right? You kind of want a good administrator to go in there and go, this one, no, we're not going to focus on that. I'm preserving this time and this focus on this stuff. Because if there's nobody running that interference, there's just way too many demands on teachers and they can't focus and they can't learn productively um, in these ways. So I think, I think part of what leaders... Chris Gutierrez, somebody said to me that, that when they look at school reform, it's almost like you can see the different strata of like a geological strata because nothing ever gets taken away. You only add stuff on, right? So like you can go into a school and you kind of have to do this geological dig of like, oh, okay, I see that's where you got this new curriculum and that's where you got this technology and that's where you, and nothing, nobody ever says, you know, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> You don't have to do 500 initiatives at once. And it seems as if the really sophisticated leaders I know help teachers focus their attention and work on like consequential things and run interference on the distractions and try to um, mediate some of the more corrosive policies. I don't know. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>